This conference will now be recorded. All right, so students, today we're going to discuss about uh, leukemia. So in the last class, we discussed about myelodysplastic syndrome, MDS, which has an increase in the number of blast cells because of the number of precursors and undifferentiated cells in the bone marrow. So it's a bone marrow failure syndrome. And leukemia is a similar thing. It's just a un, uh, what do you say? A proliferation that has no stop because of the lack of apoptosis or because of the lack of cancer markers or uh, ones that can put a stop to the proliferation. So an acute uh, myeloid leukemia is any leukemia that can be a complication of myelodysplastic syndrome as a secondary cause or it can be a primary acute myeloid leukemia. Most commonly seen in younger uh, generation, most commonly other adolescents. Here you can see uh, there are estimated uh, cases of 13,000 uh, in one year. That is AML. It's the most common type of uh, uh, <clears throat> leukemia other than non-Hodgkin's and everything else. So AML is the most common one. It's also causing the most number of deaths. You can see the epidemiology here. The incidence of AML increases with age. So even though it's more commonly diagnosed in the younger generation, uh, as it goes older, you have higher percentage of incidence and peak age of around 80 to 84. And the five-year survival is much higher in the younger age group than in the older age group. 65 plus, the five-year survival is very low. So you know that the prognosis is bad when it is diagnosed at a later age. What are the risk factors for AML? There are genetic disorders which are predisposing factors for AML, like Down syndrome, Patau syndrome, neurofibromatosis, Panconi's anemia, Kleinfelter syndrome, Kosman syndrome, Schwachmann syndrome, and is also physical and chemical exposures like benzene, embalming fluids, pesticides, herbicides, cigarette smoking. These can cause a certain changes uh, in the stem cell precursors, or you can uh, either in the pluripotent stem cells or the multipotent stem cells, which will cause increase in the number of uh, WBC. Uh, there can be so any type of uh, proliferation, can be monocytic, megaloblastic. It can be uh, most commonly here myeloblastic leukemia, so acute myeloid leukemia. And then you have radiation exposure, both therapeutic and non therapeutic radiation, either because of working in a lab or because of exposure to radiation to, uh, as a part of radiotherapy for cancer or because of working in a nuclear uh, minefield, anything like that. Chemotherapy, alkylating agents, topoisomerase 2 inhibitors, anthracyclines, which are again used in the treatment of AML, epipodophilotoxins, and taxanes. These are all the risk factors or predisposing factors for AML. So there's AML as a type of acute myeloid leukemia. There's de novo AML, which is new. Primary AML, it has no other cause. Secondary AML, there's a clinical history of myelodysplastic syndrome or myeloproliferative disorder or prior exposure to radiation, select chemicals or chemotherapy. So secondary AML because of these factors. <clears throat> so AML is also classified by French, American, British classification. This is the older one. And this is the newer one, which is uh, WHO organization classification. This is the one that we have learned in uh, pathology. And M0 is undifferentiated, so that means it is a direct uh, problem with these stem cells. I'll just go back, I'll just go to the next slide where you can see here M0. You can see the stem cell. So the stem cell is involved here. In myeloblastic without maturation and myeloblastic with maturation, obviously the myeloblast cell is involved. So without maturation, with maturation, M1, M2. And you see pro-myelocyte. That means it's before it becomes matured. Pro-myelocyte. So it's not a myelocyte. It's a pro-myelocyte. That is M3. So pro-myelocytic leukemia. And then you have M4, myelomonocytic. So this is both monoblastic and myeloblastic. So it's myelomonocytic leukemia. Contains both components. 
and then M5 is monocytic. So here you see M5 here arising from the monoblast. And then you have M6, which is erythroid. So erythroid committed cell that means something that is like a reticulocyte or erythroblast or whatever precursor of RBC there is, that is M6. The last one is M7, which is megakaryocytic committed cell. So it has to arise from a megakaryocyte. So it's megakaryoblastic. So again, M0 is an undifferentiated type of AML. M1 is myeloblastic without maturation. M2 is myeloblastic with maturation. M3 is pro-myelocytic. M4 is myelomonocytic. M5 is monocytic. M6 is erythroid. M7 is megakaryoblastic. Now, obviously, the peripheral smear will also be exactly how it is here. In M0, it's undifferentiated. So you cannot identify one particular type of cell as a predominant one. Here, there will be a myeloblast. So there will be early myeloblast without maturation. That means nuclear maturation will not have occurred. So those will be the predominant cells. Here, there will be maturation. So there may by, there might be a slightly smaller nuclei in here. And a promyelocytic, you can have the structure of a promyelocyte. In myelomonocytic, you can have both myeloblasts and monocytes. Here, only monocytes. In erythroid, you'll have erythroid hypoplasia of the bone marrow. And megakaryoblastic, you'll have giant platelets seen in the peripheral smear. So that is the FAB classification of AML. Coming to the newer one, WHO classification, much easier one. AML with recurrent genetic abnormalities and AML with multilinear dysplasia. It means there's different types of uh, dysplasia through different certain factors. AML and myelodysplastic syndrome therapy related. That means there is because of MDS or because of MDS therapy related, AML not otherwise categorized. So this is the last one, which means comes under idiopathic. AML with recurrent genetic abnormalities are translocation 8 to 21, Q22 to Q22, inversion of 16, P13 to Q22, or T16 to 16, translocation, P13 to Q22, T15, 17, Q22 to Q12, 11, Q23 abnormalities. So these are the recurrent abnormalities that you can find commonly in AML with those with genetic predisposition. So the ones who are at risk will have these type of translocations or inversions or whatnot. So this is about the classification of AML. And this is the schematic diagram that we try to understand the classification. AML presenting signs and symptoms are bone marrow failure because of anemia, fatigue, pallor, and uh, it can be seen. Thrombocytopenia because of bleeding and, bru bleeding and bruising. Neutropenia, infection, and fever are the manifestations. Leukemic infiltration of tissues can cause hepatomegaly, lymphadenopathy, splenomegaly, bone pain, leukemia cutis, that is infiltration of the skin, gingival infiltration, and CNS infiltration. CNS infiltration is a fatal uh, complication of AML, so this needs to be treated with excess drugs. So AML presenting signs and symptoms with oncologic emergencies. There is a tumor lysis syndrome that can occur commonly in AML. The presentation is hyperuricemia. Everything's hyper except calcium, hypocalcemia. So hyperuricemia, acute renal failure, hyperphosphatemia, metabolic acidosis, hyperkalemia, and cardiac arrhythmias because of these abnormalities. These electrolyte abnormalities can cause cardiac arrhythmias. Now, uh, hyperkalemia can present with tall T waves and eventually it will lead to a sine wave pattern uh, leading to ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. Hypocalcemia can cause QT prolongation. So if a patient comes to uh, you with either elevated heart rate or because of a decreased heart rate, you have to get an ECG done. If the ECG shows any sort of particular uh, electrolyte disturbances, then you have to consider the diagnosis of tumor syndrome in a patient with a peripheral smear that is suggestive of AML. So hyperleukocytosis or leukocystis syndrome is a fatal complication of AML because of the excess number of leukocytes in blood. Usually it has to be more than one lakh. So the normal WBC count is 4,000 to 12,000, 4,000 to 11,000 cells per cubic millimeter. 4,000 to 11,000 cells per cubic millimeter. If there is some sort of infection, we'll have an elevated leukocyte count, goes up to 15,000, maybe some 20,000, but in severe cases, around 30,000. But in case of leukemia, there will also be leukocytosis along with undifferentiated pre, uh, 
precursors. So blast cells will be seen. That is greater than 30% blast cells will be seen in the uh, WBC count. And the WBC count will be greater than 30,000. It's usually in the, in the range of uh, 50,000 to 1 lakh. So here, if it's greater than 1 lakh, so there will be dyspnea, altered mental status, chest pain, cranial nerve palsies, and headache because of leukostasis. That means there's some sort of obstruction that is causing these symptoms. So how do we diagnose a AML? It's, it's simple. The patient is having a clinical presentation. It's a common one. Usually comes with hepatosplenomegaly. It comes with bleeding gums. That is the most common presentation for thrombocytopenia. And gingival hyperplasia can be seen. So then you go for the blood count. WBCs are usually elevated, 50,000 to 1 lakh. Maybe normal or low. Often anemia and thrombocytopenia can be seen. The blood film will show blast cells. And these are the big blasters that can be seen. These are the precursors of myeloblasts, sorry, of lymphocytes. So you can see these blast cells here. Sorry, uh, these are the precursors of myelo myeloid cells. So these are myeloid stem cells that can be seen uh, proliferating here, undifferentiated here. So then next we go for bone marrow aspirate and refine to look for hypercellular the presence of blasts is greater than 20% and the presence of all rods, that is the AML type, all rods. All rods can be seen in AML. Cytochemistry uh, and special strains to differentiate AML from ALL. Uh, positivity with Sudan black and myeloperoxidase. So myeloperoxidase will be seen in AML uh, because of the uh, pigmentation of uh, blast cells. These are all rods in leukemic cells. You can see them here. Then you have MP. This is the myeloperoxidase in the Sudan black stain on the. This is the Sudan black stain. This is the myeloperoxidase stain showing intense localized positivity in blasts. So these are the blast cells that you can see which have absorbed MP1 Sudan black stain. Next, the AML treatment. Uh, because now we have uh, had a clinical diagnosis, probably thought it was uh, because of some sort of thrombocytopenia or because of some pancytopenia. When you have pancit opinion, you go for a pelvis smear, you find blast cells, then you go for a bone marrow picture. When you find blast cells over there, then you go for uh, psychochemistry, look for genetic counseling. And then if you find something that relates to AML, you start treatment after confirmation of diagnosis through flow cytometry and cytochemistry. And the primary goal is complete remission here. Complete remission is necessary. Sole outcome currently associated with improved survival. And most important initial response reported in phase three trials. So phase three trials of this complete remission has been achieved long back, obviously. And uh, here we have the chemotherapy for AML. The induction is four to six weeks. Usually uh, anthracycline, vincristine, prednisone, cyclophosphamide, L-aspaginase. A combination of two drugs are usually used. And usually is cytorabine, which is not given here. It's given in the next slide. Cytorabine plus anthracycline. So, idarubicin or donorubicin, most commonly donorubicin is used here. And uh, it's a three plus seven day regimen. We'll go, get back to that in the next few slides. Uh, the next part is consolidation. So, here you have to have induction, consolidation, and maintenance. Three things, right? Induction for four to six weeks, consolidation for a period of over six to nine month period, multiple cycles of intensive chemotherapy. Here you can again give cytosine arabinoside. Hydro, high dose methotrexate, etoposide, anthracycline in form of pedorubicin or donorubicin. And then you have maintenance phase. You don't want too toxic here because 18 to 24 months. So you have to go for a slightly lower form of toxicity. So LPs with intrathecal methotrexate every three months can go. Mostly when Christine can also be given. Uh, six mercaptopurin daily and weekly methotrexate can also be given as a regimen. Here you see there's no anthracyclines, there's no cytarab in here because there are much more. Uh, and even cyclophosphamide because they are much more toxic than these drugs. So you want the maintenance phase, which is longer, to have slightly less toxic drugs. So what, what is complete remission? That mean in case of AML treatment, when you give the patient uh, an induction, this is induction. You give the patient certain drugs, and then you wait for a response. You look for morphologic, cytogenic, or molecular complete remission is when there is greater than 1,000 neutrophils in the blood, and the platelets are also greater than 1,000, but the blast cells are less than 5%, and flow cytometry is negative, and cytogenetics are normal, and molecular genetics are normal, and extramedullary disease should be absent. 
so this is uh, the definition of complete remission greater than 1000 neutrophils per microliter greater than 1 lakh uh, platelets per microliter and last cells bone marrow in less than 5% and flow cytometry cytogenetics and molecular genetics are all normal so this is a treatment overview there's a remission induction the goal to reduce tumor burden and restore normal hematopoiesis 7 plus 3 Continuous infusion, cytorabin into seven days, and an anthocycline into three days remains standard of care. That's the best form of treatment that we can give at this juncture. The best anthocycline is probably donorubicin. Intensification with high dose cytorabin or adipocyte can also be given. And time sequential chemotherapy is very important for assessing remission induction. If remission induction is not achieved, the second time sequential chemotherapy should be given with. 7 plus 3 regimen of cytorabin and anthocycline. Probably add one more drug to this. And the next one is post remission consolidation therapy. Once in complete remission, long term survival requires post remission treatment. Chemotherapy versus allogenic transplant versus autologous stem transplant. Now, you need to give chemotherapy in all patients with stem transplant, then you can go for allogenic or autologous stem transplant. And Stem transplant does confer almost complete cure, but there will also be again relapses here too. So what is the initial treatment is based on age and comorbidities. That means there should be an age less than 65 years. The comorbidities also need to be taken into account. And history of prior myelodysplasia or cytotoxic chemotherapy. Performance status has to be assessed. Cytogenetics often unknown at time of treatment initiation. So you have to assess it after the treatment is started because it takes time. So the treatment of older patients greater than 65 years, the therapeutic diverge point. Patient related factors are greater treatment related mortality, greater frequency of comorbid conditions, greater treatment related mortality again. And disease related, uh, I think this is repeated, sorry. Disease related factors are greater, uh, sorry, more often preceded by myelodysplasia or myeloproliferative syndrome. Because even MDS is more common in the elderly. That's the disease of the elderly, it's greater than in 65 years. And greater association with unfavorable cytogenetics. Uh, we've not discussed what cytogenetics are unfavorable because it's beyond the scope of this class, but we can read and go, go back and read in Harrison. It's given very clearly. Greater expression of multi drug resistance can be seen in older individuals. Decreased complete uh, remission and over symptoms can be seen. So uh, what about the treatment of older patients? What do you give? The standard chemotherapy has no significant survival advantage. It's potential for increased toxicity. Reduced intensity chemotherapy also has no significant survival ad advantage. So the clinical trial of using a drug to make the patient un uh, go into complete remission may be the optimal for patients who are fit to receive chemotherapy. For the ones who are unfit to receive chemotherapy, you can give supportive care. So the evaluation and treatment of uh, CNS leukemia. CNS disease is uncommon at presentation. Routine screening and diagnosis in asymptomatic patients is not recommended. Patients with neurological symptoms at diagnosis should have a CT or MRA. If CT or MRA is negative, then LP and begin with chemotherapy if indicated. If CET or MRA is positive for mass effect or increased intracranial pressure, you have to consider radiotherapy to shrunk the tumor and then you go for chemotherapy, induction chemotherapy. However, routine screening of patients with AML and remission is not recommended unless M4 or M5 morphology is seen. M4 is myelomonocytic, M5 is monocytic. So if these are seen, then you can go for uh, screening of patients with AML for any CNS leukemia. WBC count of greater than 1 lakh in diagnosis, you have to go for CNS leukemia uh, monitoring. Patients with plus cytology should receive intrathecal chemotherapy or have documented clearance following first cycle of High-dose cyto cytorabin arabinoside. High-dose cytorabin arabinoside. You have to have documented clearance that there is no CNS leukemia. So the prognostic factors are obviously age. If the age is more bad prognosis, cytogenetics are bad. Bad prognosis, molecular mutation. If it's too much, it's bad prognosis. Secondary AML has bad prognosis. Performance status is bad prognosis. If the status is low. Leukocyte count is presentation is very important. If it's less than 30,000, that's good prognosis. If it's greater than 1 lakh, it is bad prognosis. Here, this, you have the age and outcome because of AML. Complete response, less than 65, 65 exam 56 years, 64%. Decreases gradually with greater than 75 years. Median survival in months is also decreasing. 
within survival, free survival uh, is also decreasing and mortality within 30 days of injection is very high in case of greater than 75 years so the age is one of the very important prognostic factors outcomes of patients with secondary aml are poor compared to de novo aml so primary AML, you don't know what the cause is, so it's new, but the outcomes are better. Unknown if due to biologic or morphology characteristics unique to secondary AML versus prior injury to organs in vasculature. So it can be because of prior injury to the vas organs that can cause uh, increased mortality in secondary AML because of the depletion of hematopoietic stem cells or because of chronic immunosuppression from prior therapy. And prior pathogenic flora colonization can also be one of the risk factors for increased mortality. And frequency of intermediate or unfavorable cytogenetics higher in secondary AML. So this sort of cytogenetics is more common in secondary AML. So AML is a disease that you need to diagnose early, treat early, and make sure the patient goes into complete remission. And there is a high chance of relapse. So presenting leukocyte count and outcome, if the WBC is less than 30,000, it's considered favorable. High leukocyte presentation is considered a negative prognostic factor. We've discussed that. No association between induction death and presenting WBC greater than 1 lakh. Death rate is greater than 50% with leukostasis at presentation. So outcome similar to patients with lower leukocyte counts at presentation once past early phase of induction. So it's the same with lower leukocyte counts at presentation once it's past the early phase of induction. So that's the end of today's class. Thank you for listening. And if you have any doubts, you can ask me in the chat box.